God created all people in his image and likeness, and they all have the same inherent rights, regardless of age, sex, race, or color. The Free Methodist Church is therefore committed to the dignity and worth of all humans, including the unborn, the dying, and the woman. Pro-life per se is an affirmation of the right to live for the un unborn baby and the opportunity to survive for the patient who is at the point of death or suffering from an incurable and painful disease. Life begins at conception. As God breathes into the life of the unborn baby, the DNA coded information that contains all the physical features of a baby is formed at conception. A baby's heartbeat can be detected as early as three weeks. I hold in my hand, I don't know if you can see this, but I hold in my hand a cast image of a 10 week old baby's feet. This baby is fully formed at this stage and has a soul. Psalm 139 verse 13 and 16 say, for you formed my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed. And in your book, they all were written, the days fashioned for me, when as yet there was none of them. God has a plan for every child that is conceived. And to take the life of an unborn child is to interrupt God's loving care and purpose for their lives. Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 5 says, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you a prophet to the nations. Life belongs to our creator God, and he who gives life is the only one with the authority to take it. If abortion is needed to bring the death of an unborn baby in the womb, then that baby is considered to be living. I understand that a woman has a right to decide what to do with her body. I would advocate, however, that those decisions be made with the leading of the Holy Spirit, as it is a matter of morality as well as health. In cases where the mother's life is in medical danger and the unborn baby cannot be saved, medical ethics advises the survival of the mother. Unwanted pregnancies due to intimacy with boyfriends or forced pregnancies through rape is a thing of shame and pain, and the woman believes her only choice is to terminate the pregnancy. However, there are adoption agencies and resources to support such women all through pregnancy. Prevention, I believe, is better than cure. Our society is rife with fornication, adultery, pornography, and every sexual sin that can be named. The solution is not to keep giving pills that will prevent pregnancy, thereby encouraging more moral decadence, but to re-educate the society and create a moral culture where God's purpose for sexual intimacy will be understood and accepted and the sanctity of marriage restored. Families need to return to God if children are taught the ways of God and the sacredness of sexual intimacy, the love and the fear of God will be instilled in the hearts of people. And as they see their bodies as the temple of the Holy Spirit, there will be caution. Our society needs a paradigm shift from satisfying the flesh to honoring God with our spirit, soul, and body. People need a change of heart. Like Joel 2.13 says, we need to rend our hearts, not our garments. We can politicize it all we want. The abortion statistics will not change until people's hearts are transformed by the Holy Spirit who can help us with self-control. Let us deal with this problem from its very root by turning to God for help. Euthanasia is a painless killing of a patient with an incurable disease or who is in a state of coma. The God who gives life, again, is the only one that can take that life. God has healed incredible diseases. 
There have been people and testimonies of miracles and how God healed them. I have personally experienced a return from physical death to life. A member of my church who the doctor declared dead has been brought back to life through prayers. I have seen someone who came back to life after being in a coma for more than three months. So the point here is life does not end until God who gives life commands it to end. The life of Job is a case in point. We need to let God play his role as the giver and taker of life. This leads me to the issue of pro-woman. Of recent, a female doctor trainee was raped and murdered in India. And last week, Olympic athlete Rebecca Cheptege was killed by a former boyfriend. According to the World Health Organization, approximately 30% of women worldwide have been have experienced physical and or sexual violence by men. Why? In Genesis chapter one, I know that Jennifer referred to that. God created a man and a woman and blessed them to subdue the earth and have dominion over every living creature. God's call to man and woman was equal. Not the same, not identical, but definitely not one less and one greater than the other. God created a woman as a helper suitable for Adam, comparable to him. The word helper in Genesis chapter 2 is a Hebrew word, Eza, from the root word, Aza, meaning to surround, protect, or aid. A helper is a succor, a rescuer. And like Jennifer said, this same word, this same Eza was used to describe God as being a helper. You can check that out in Psalm 33. Deuteronomy 33 and other scriptures. Definitely God is not less than man because that word is used for God. Kenejo is a Hebrew word that means suitable or right for situation. So the woman is Eza Konejo, and this means a helper, a power, strength that is suitable and corresponding to. Together, as corresponding powers, Adam and Eve were created with strength to be all that God had proposed them to be. And that was why God said, it was very good. In Genesis 2, God said, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. No one superior or subordinate. See, God's design from creation was that the woman who was the height and crown of God's creation, the cherry on the cake, so to speak, was to protect, support, and comfort the man made from the ground. The essence of the man is his physical strength, but the essence of the woman is beauty with emotional strength. They both complemented each other. Unfortunately, due to sin, God pronounced a curse on Adam and Eve. While Adam would need to sweat and labor before he could eat, Eve's sorrow would multiply through childbearing and subjection to the husband. As a result, the devil went to work in the man. The man did not only rule over the woman, but subjected her to a subordinate position, to the level of being a property or possession, like a house or a slave. And so the man was not held accountable on how he treated his wife, but the woman was. The story of the woman caught in adultery is an example. The curse at Eden, praise God, has been broken. Galatians 3.13 says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. This redemption reverses the curse over the woman and her dominion by man. Galatians 3.28 says, There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. God has redeemed us and has brought the man and woman back, not just to where they were on the level of Adam and Eve, but on the level of Jesus Christ, the second Adam. We are now joined heirs with Christ, and seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Romans 8 and Ephesians 7, uh, Ephesians 2 will, will tell you that. Some might say, well, the apostle Paul writes, a woman should submit to her husband in Ephesians 5, like Jen referred to. But I will say, Paul was counseling and emphasizing the need for unity in marriage. You see, the woman has no problem loving the husband. She has a problem submitting to the husband. The same way, the man has no problem allowing the woman to make decisions. The husband has a problem loving the wife and not any other woman. 
And so Paul was addressing their areas of weakness and making sure that there's strength in those areas of weakness. Someone else might point out that Paul admonished women to learn in silence, not speak in the church, and not to teach a man in 1 Timothy chapter 2 and 1 Corinthians chapter 14. However, they also forget that Paul said in Ephesians 5 to submit one and to another in the fear of God. The Bible is full of women appointed by God to occupy roles of authority and gifted for ministry. Every verse in the Bible must be interpreted in the light of the whole witness in the Bible. If God wanted women to be silent, he would not have endowed them with ministry gifts and authority. Miriam was a prophetess, an exhorter, and a preacher. Deborah was a prophetess, a judge of the nation of Israel. She was a teacher, a pastor, a military leader of the Israelites. Huldah was a prophetess. God used her to speak to kings, to priests, and to men. And then the first evangelist that we have in the New Testament was a woman at the well. And we can go on and on. This means the Apostle Paul was speaking within a specific context when he needed to correct the behavior of certain women who were disruptive and out of order during church services. He was not banning women from preaching or teaching the scriptures or talking in church. He acknowledged many women as his co-laborers in the work of ministry. Priscilla, with her husband, uh, with her husband actually discipled Apollos. They were co-ministers with the Apostle Paul. Judea and Sintich were poor co-laborers. Junia was a female apostle. These women could not have fun functioned as leaders in the church if they were not allowed to speak in the church. So why do churches not even prevent, not prevent women from singing or teaching in Sunday schools since they are all part of speaking in church? So God does not discriminate in the gifting of, giving of gifts. God gives his Holy Spirit to all people, men and women. And that is why in Joel 2, he said that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and this included women. At Pentecost, women were among the 120 in the upper room, and they were baptized in the Holy Spirit. Not for them to go home and be silent, but for them to minister the word of God. And like B.T. Roberts will say, to prevent women from utilizing their God-given gifts is usurpation and tyranny. So salvation is a package. Why is it that we can accept salvation from sin and not freedom from the curse of the law? When men sexualize women and objectify them by indulging in, in a fantasy in which they believe that women exist solely for their own pleasure, they dehumanize women. When they see women only as second-class citizens and the property of a man, they brutalize women. As I have stated concerning pro-life, so I state here, our society needs to be educated on the God-given role of men and women. This should be thought, this should be through a paradigm shift by bringing the Bible back to our homes, schools, offices, courts, and parks, and teaching the truth in our churches. Unless people's hearts are changed, the culture cannot be changed. God has given us salvation from sin and deliverance from the cause of Eden. God bless you abundantly.